Well, hello, everyone. I'm Bill Marazzo, and I have the high honor of serving as your president and CEO of WHYY. We're honored here this evening that you've decided to spend some time with us. The people of this region, as you know, the country, the world, has faced a series of devastating events and challenges over the past 18 months. It has forced each of us to change our way of life. It certainly has tested the thoughts and beliefs that many of us have taken for granted. During these unprecedented times, though, many of you turned to WHYY for truthful, balanced information and quality entertainment as we, with you, continue to wrestle with the pandemic along with social and political turmoil here and abroad. But you can be sure that WHYY will continue to provide these vital services to the tri-state area steeped in the courage of our convictions and armed with the powerful support of our community. Some of you are first-time supporters, and I'm certainly very, very grateful to you for that. And we also want to welcome back this evening our returning supporters and members of the WHYY growing family. As your member-supported PBS and NPR station for southeastern Pennsylvania, South Jersey, and Delaware, WHYY would not be able to create programs like this one without your support. Tonight, we have White House correspondent for PBS's NewsHour and the moderator of Washington Week, Yamish Alcindor. Yamish, of course, will be talking to WHYY's Sandra Clark. She is our Vice President for News and Civic Dialogue. This event is presented, frankly, in partnership with another of WHYY's projects, Your Democracy, and it is supported by our good friends at the Sutherland family. Our events are just one way that we try to reach to connect with each of you through our radio, television, and digital offerings. WHYY supplies this region with trusted news and entertainment when and how you want it. Information about all of this can be found on whyy.org. So if you want to find the latest news or get tickets to our virtual events with great names of folks like Judy Woodruff or Bob Costa or Rick Steves, don't also forget to visit our website, whyy.org backslash events. And while you're there, please consider supporting this local public media station with an additional donation. So thank you again for joining us this evening, and please help me to give a warm welcome to my colleague, Sandra Clark, and Yamish Alcindor. HYY. I also think it's really exciting um, to have this conversation on daylight today when so much news is breaking from infrastructure to the January 6th commission. It's a great day to talk about being a journalist. Yeah, yeah, well, and you you do it um, better than anyone. And so we're thrilled to have you here. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, note to our audience, you know, please submit your questions and I'll ask them uh, during the Q&A at the end uh, of our conversation tonight. So Yamish, I know you just celebrated a birthday. So belated happy birthday. We'll start there. Hope you had some fun on that day. I had um, you know, I, you, I can't believe you're only 35. I mean, you have packed in so much. Newsday, USA Today, The Washington Post, The New York Times. Uh, now you're a Washington correspondent for PBS NewsHour and moderator of Washington Week. And you've covered some of the, you know, biggest stories of our times. Uh, from Trayvon Martin's killing to Sandy Hook to Obama and Trump's elections, the insurrection, and now the Biden administration. And so my question is this, uh, have your parents forgiven you yet for becoming a journalist instead of a lawyer? It's a great question um, <laughs> because I think that, you know, the, at the heart of that question is the fact that my family was a family who immigrated here in the 1970s from Haiti. My father and my mother met at Boston College. They didn't know each other in Haiti, but met while studying there. And immigrants especially my family they were they are they're often looking for stability i was just mm -hmm. reading i was just reading about the the author of the Al alchemist who is of course this record breaking amazing book that was like on the new york times seller bestseller list yeah. for years um he was saying how his parents literally wanted him to be an engineer and he talked about the fact that his intention the intention of his parents he could see their intention because they really just wanted a stable sort of financially smart decision so my mm -hmm. dad my senior year was calling me collect from Haiti, which was like $20 a call <laughs> saying, why are you not going to law school? You got into law school, which I did get into law school. And he was just sort of livid. Fast forward, if you get my dad now, he's like, oh, my daughter is, is the <laughs> person who is a White House correspondent. You know, she has her own show. Yeah. So he's absolutely forgiven me. And I think he's now <laughs> on the other side of past forgiveness to gloating a bit. Um, and, and he's definitely proud of me, which I feel 
very, very excited about. And I will say, you know, one of the things I think about when I think about my, my parents, but my mom was, was more supportive than my dad, but mm -hmm. my parents also grew up in a time where journalists, especially in Haiti, could be killed and are mm -hmm. still being killed. So journalism was also a sort of dangerous profession in their eyes. Um, and it's in some ways, if you look at the United States and you look at the death threats that journalists are getting now, it's a sort of dangerous profession now, but not like it was in Haiti, which is where you could literally be killed by the state for reporting on, on the dictator that they both grew up under. Yeah, and I, you know, your your roots run deep, and I'm sure it gives you added perspective as you try to cover these big issues uh, of our times. I, I think it's an interesting that you consider yourself a civil rights reporter and not a political reporter. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I think I, I would say I probably consider myself both, and in, in mm -hmm. some ways a human rights reporter too. I think that at the end of the day, what grounds my reporting this idea that I really want to be covering the intersection of politics and power. And I want to always be reporting on stuff that is that it's illuminating the sort of most vulnerable populations among us. And I also want to be always illuminating the, the problems that we have in this country as it relates to racial disparities because mm -hmm. that those issues are in every single beat that I've covered, whether it's education or transportation or healthcare or covering the White House, race is always a central part of, of, of how these different beats are developing and evolving. So for me, being a civil rights reporter really just means, I mean, I would say a civil rights reporter that's also a political reporter, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it really means not, not being scared to confront front hard subjects, not being scared to talk about civil rights, not being scared to talk about sort of all of the different um, ways that America is still not treating people equally. And I think that that's something that we should not be shy about. Um, I think it's really easy to sort of try to play it safe and try not to talk about race or, and, and try not to talk about the disparities among black people and white people, frankly, mm -hmm. um, but they're there. They, they're always there and they bubble up every few years. And they're in a large part why when we see these sort of big political movements, these big social movements, it has to often do with race. When you think about the death of George Floyd, when you think about what happened in Ferguson, mm -hmm. Missouri, when you think about what happened after the after the, sh the beating of Rodney King, um, all of these cases, all of these sort of big seminal moments, they often deal with race and, and the way that we treat people in America. Yeah, you know, I think one of the interesting things that happened, you know, after the uh, murder of George Floyd, and there was reckonings all over the place, right, uh, whether they're real or imagined or promised or not. And, uh, you know, and I think a lot of journalists of color and Black journalists in particular, uh, you know, started to have this moment of, you know, oftentimes covering Black people, uh, you know, is is the peril, you know, to many people's careers. And there's, it's not, our newsrooms are still way too white. Uh, in, uh, in general, and so it's not been a comfortable place for many Black journalists. Um, you know, I'm sure you heard from many people and probably had some, you know, deeper thoughts yourself about that. Can you share some of that with us? Yeah, I've been lucky that um, for the most part, the majority of my mentors, the majority of my editors, superiors, producers, editors, they, they've they really been um I think really supportive of the idea of covering race, of covering civil rights, of not only covering that, but of, of mm -hmm, but of making mm -hmm. it a big part of my career and not shying away from that. Um, I think about when I started in 2016, my first big political reporting job was covering Bernie Sanders for the New York Times. And one mm -hmm. of my first front page stories was about the fact that Bernie Sanders had an issue with, with diversity, that he was not getting enough black voters, enough support from black people, that his, his rallies were overwhelmingly white and that that was gonna be in a, key, a, a, real, a real weakness um, as he tried to win the nomination and it proved to be true in 2016 and it proved to be true in 2020. Um, so I think that for me, I've, I've always definitely, I think been really, really comfortable in that. I will also say that I've been a black journalist who has embraced covering race. I have mm -hmm. friends that want to cover sports, that want to cover entertainment. Now that doesn't mean that race isn't included in that, mm -hmm. but they really, in some ways, they don't want to only be thinking about race or to, or to be sort of tasked with, the, with, 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 with covering race if they don't want to. I think that that should be everyone's purview that just because you're African-American in a newsroom you should not be the person to say, well, you know, a new racial issue has popped mm -hmm. up. Here's your beat. I will also say that I had a couple um, people, especially I would think of one editor at a national paper who said, you know, you write too much about black people. And Nicole Hannah Jones, mm -hmm. um, she <laughs> tells a story of, of, of hearing from editors who, who, who basically were almost destroying her career saying you were writing too much about black people. Mm -hmm. I would zoom out a bit and, thought, and think about Toni Morrison, the great Toni Morrison, mm -hmm. I would say, she's my favorite author. She was told, why not write for white people? Why are you always writing about black people? And in each case, myself, 
Nicole, Tony, I wouldn't say that I would be in a category with them per se, but I think what I, I say all that to say that we are three black women who were told, you know, don't write about race. And we've all sort of, we all chose to, to not to continue to write about race. And I think it's, of course, for Toni Morrison, it worked out amazingly in, in her career. Um, Nicole Hannah Jones, of course, has been just, uh, I think, a, a, a real giant in journalism living among us. And then for me, I, I shrugged my shoulders mm -hmm. and said no. And I will say, when I told one editor, what, an, what that editor had told me, it was, I, would, I remember it like it was yesterday, I heard that from an editor saying, you know, you write too much about Black people. This was at the height um, of the death of Trayvon Martin when I was really mm -hmm. chronicling all of the different things that were happening with that, with, with that trial. To be told that was really disheartening, but I told another editor, hey, here's what this editor told me. And it was a white man who I told, and he said, mm -hmm. don't listen to her. He told me, you go and you do what the kind of reporting that 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 we need at this paper. And I was in some ways, mm -hmm. I think he had my back in a real way, in a real moment. And it would have been really hard if I didn't have people who said, continue doing what you're doing. But I'm here to say, especially for someone who maybe is watching this, whether whether it's in journalism or maybe it's, it's as a lawyer, you're saying that people are telling you you're taking too many Black cases or it's an accountant or whatever it is that your field is. I think that you should go with what your heart's passion is because I've always said the things that make me cry are the things that end up on the front page of the New York Times or the A block of PBS News Hour or at the A block of Washington Week. Um, mm. I think that I am someone who doesn't, I don't, I try not to be overly emotional, but I lead with my emotions. I want to feel stories. I want to feel mm -hmm. human connection. And I think that that to me is a way that I've been able to stay really true to who I am. Yeah. You know, I think that's one of the things that really stands out about you. I mean, as journalists, you know, we're we're sort of trained, right, to be so middle of the road, to not have any emotion, to almost not have not not be human. Uh, and so I, I think one of the things where you exude, you, you exude that you care, uh, you know, and it's not that other journalists don't, but, you know, we are trained in a certain kind of way. You know, one of the tweets that uh, you sent out, um, you know, I think it was the, when the, the uh, verdict of the Derek Chauvin verdict came out and you, you, you recognized um, Darnella Frazier you know, who, the 17 year old who filmed the death of George Floyd. And you said, you know, she quite literally changed the world. Uh, she testified, uh, there are nights she stays up apologizing and apologizing to George Floyd for not having done more. And you're I'm imagining a 17 year old, uh, you know, who witnessed it, who filmed it. And then you said, but she did so, so much to get this murder conviction. You know, talk about sort of how that that impacted you. I mean, here's a 17 year old who, who, you know, created this, this change and who also, you know, was, was very key to the conviction, but took this, was also on the stand. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I'm not ashamed to say that when I watched part of the George, of the, uh, of the, of the trial of Derek Chauvin for the murder of George Floyd, that I was brought to tears. Yeah. Darnella Frazier was someone who shook me to my core because here was a 17 year old child who was talking about the fact that she felt like she didn't do enough for George Floyd. She here's someone who was cited by the Pulitzers for having 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 recorded this seminal image, this seminal video, nine minutes and 25 seconds of, of, of a clear video, of a steady video of a man literally dying before her eyes. Um, it's remarkable that she did that. It's remarkable that our that we live in a country where she has to do that where she knew she had to do that in order for, for, for George Floyd to likely get justice. Um, I don't think that that trial happens without the video of Darnella Frazier. Um, and I think to me as a journalist, we should be able to recognize that. And I think in some ways, Darnella Frazier, um, it, uh, she underscores that journalism, yes, it should be in some ways done by professional trained people, but that we rely a lot of times, especially in these ages um, where people have cell phones, where people are are recording things that are going on in the neighborhood that we also need to be very, very honest that, that some of the things that are happening and some of the images that we're seeing, we are reporting on things that were that were recorded by other people. So Donella Frazier, she, if she was a journalist, she would have just won a straight up Pulitzer, right? Like there's yeah, no, yeah. there's no question that if you were a journalist <laughs> holding that, um, I think, I think of Ferguson, Missouri, there, Ferguson, Missouri does not get the same level of attention. The death of Michael Brown does not get the same level of scrutiny without young people, his mother and other young journalists coming as young journalists, but also community members coming out and tweeting and writing about the fact that people mm -hmm. in Ferguson, Missouri were fed up and that this this young man's death needed to be investigated. Yeah, I, you know, one of the things um, we talk about here at WHYY is how so many people commit acts of journalism all the time and um, aren't journalists, but here they are, right? They're, um, you know, 
they're documenting, they're providing vital information, their communities and certainly giving us a, a real look into what the real stories are sometimes when we're not in every, every space. Uh, you know, when I asked, uh, so I sort of, sort of put the question, I like, what would you ask Amish? And everybody wanted me to talk to you about the Trump years. <laughs> uh, you know, of course, right? Um, you know, and of course we, we all watched you with, um, I mean, you know, look, you, you got still running through you uh, with both admiration and, and I would say concern. And uh, as, you know, former president, you know, made you one of his favorite targets, along with other Black women journalists like April Ryan and Abby Phillips and, and other, you know, journalists who were not, uh, you know, people of color, but he certainly went after women, certainly went after Black women. And there are even like YouTube compilations of some of his greatest hits and, you know, no pun intended. Uh, you know, he called your questions racist, snarky, nasty, untruthful, tried to shush you repeatedly scolded you to be nice and not threatening. Um, you know, how did you manage that day after day? You know, but to me, it was by sticking by sticking to my purpose. Um, I became a journalist. I should, I should back up and say I became a journalist because of, of, of the murder of Emmett Till. Um, seeing an image of him, his face maimed, disfigured, learning the story of Jet Magazine, putting his 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 images in their magazine and, and that really changing the, the course of history. It made me fall in love with journalism. And I think that I have that sort of resolve at the end of the day that we are supposed to be here to hold people accountable, to bring hard truths to America. And especially in 2020, uh, well, I, so I should say in 2018, when the, when the president called my question racist, I thought there was no other question that needed to be asked that mm -hmm. day after he had lost the, the midterm election and it was clear that the Democrats had won. And he had won, he had run this campaign that was overtly dealing with race, overtly um, running ads that were even deemed too racist for Fox News to air. That was the, mm -hmm. the, the election cycle where mm -hmm. Fox News literally saw some of the ads that the Trump campaign wanted to run and said, no, sorry, they're too racist. When that is happening, it, to me, it behooves us as journalists to stand up and say, well, are you trying to embolden white nationalists? Is that part mm -hmm. of your target or is this just happening? I think now that I think back on the Trump years, is I think it's a core question that is a central question to all four years of the Trump administration. Were you doing this on purpose? Were you really trying to get the Proud Boys to be excited and to break into the U.S. Capitol? Mm -hmm. Or was this all just sort of a part of a political play? And this just so happened to be the people who were excited. So, you know, I mean, there are, of course, a lot of critics who would say President Trump himself was racist. I think as a reporter, mm -hmm. our goal is to try to get the person themselves to answer the question for themselves. So that's that. But then mm -hmm. you, you fast forward to 2020. I remember just being a scared American, right? Mm -hmm. Remember? like March 2020 I was mm -hmm. scared I was calling my mama in Miami mm -hmm. I'm calling my cousin saying what is this virus my husband's looking at me like I'm crazy because I'm going out mm -hmm. every day still covering mm -hmm. the White House still going out like we, we, White House reporters really we really never stopped we never worked from home right in some ways we I wouldn't consider us frontline workers in the way that doctors and nurses were quite literally saving people's lives but we were mm -hmm. out there right we were out there I was at the super spreader events quote unquote wrapped up and uh, you know masked up all yeah, <laughs> but yeah. still at these events so to me, when I was asking the question, the, the questions that I was asking, they were for the American people who I knew were just as scared as me. When I think mm -hmm. about the questions that the president got mad at, it was, are we going to have enough tests? Do we have enough ventilators? Mm -hmm. What happened to the pandemic's office that was disbanded under mm -hmm. your watch? I mean, these are critical questions that were literally just like, are we going to be able to get through this? Can you tell my mother in Florida who's watching this right now that she's going to be okay if she gets sick, that there's going to be a ventilator for her? And there are questions that the president didn't want to answer. And I think, you know, my resolve and my calm was that I thought you really don't have the, the answer to these questions. Like you're deflecting at a time where Americans really want to know these answers. Yeah. I, you know, so what else is in your postmortem of those years? I mean, I think, I think that there are years that, uh, are, are continuing to be with us. I think mm -hmm, the thing that mm -hmm. probably sticks with me is that January 6th, I think a lot of people saw it as like the end of something. And it was really, I think the, the beginning of another phase that was that is leaning on some of the things that, that former President Trump was doing, the false claims, the lies, mm -hmm. the sort of language that was deemed racist. Um, I think all of those things, I think, are, are, are with us today. I think the, the, the dangers uh, of lying about an election and, and, and subverting American democracy remain with us today. I think that we are still living with a lot of the consequences um, and that, and that President Biden, while he won the election and got more votes than any other person in U.S. history running for president, I think that we can already see in the last elections with Virginia and critical race theory and all these mm -hmm, sort of mm -hmm. new lies that are that are floating around. 
and I have to say lies because, you know, critical race theory, there was a whole campaign run in Virginia that said, I'm going to ban critical race theory in Virginia schools. It's not taught in Virginia schools, right? Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. To me, that's that's part of what the core of being a journalist is. I think we can shy away from saying, oh, well, you know, we'll say, you know, the untruths or whatever it is, but it's like, no, when, when we know for a fact that critical race theory mm -hmm. isn't being taught in public schools, we just need to say that so that people understand that. There are all sorts of other questions and all sorts of other disagreements on abortion, on taxes, on immigration. Like, there are mm -hmm. all sorts of sort of valid arguments to be made between Democrats and Republicans. But I think that part of, I think, what the, the postmortem of the Trump years is that they remain with us and that the tools and lessons that we learned as journalists, lessons like just speak plainly mm -hmm. about what is a lie, um, being blunt about calling out falsehoods, um, not shying away from talking about race when it is staring us in the face, that those things need to come with us into this new phase. So, so you know, what are your thoughts about how, how journalists are doing in terms of covering some of these issues? And, and do you think that there is some validity uh, to, you know, people maybe not trusting journalists or thinking that there's bias? I mean, you know, how do you process all of that? You know, well, one thing I'll say, I, this tweet really sort of got me to thinking about sort of the time that we're living in. A journalist, because we're journalists, we spend a lot of time talking about like sort of the distrust in media. Then when you look at surveys, there's a distrust in science, there's a distrust in politics. I think we're living through an age where mm -hmm. Americans in general are looking at sort of these institutions, whether it's journalism or science, and and really are skeptical for all sorts of different reasons. And I, don't, I think that's across the political um, mm -hmm. spectrum. Um, so I think that's one thing I would say. I think the other thing I would say is, you know, for most journalists, I think that they're really trying to do their that, that they're trying to do their best. Um, we are all learning how to cover all of the different things that we're dealing with. So I'm not a media critic. So in some ways, I would just say that I think when I when I see my colleagues um, trying to do good work, I, I think that most people get into journalism with with the intention of, of telling stories that are accurate and that are fair. I have my favorite journalists um, that are that I think are doing amazing jobs in there. I think from from you know NBC to, to CBS. So of course PBS and, and some mm -hmm. of my colleagues, I think of like William Brangham right now. He, I think he's mm -hmm. he's probably the top climate reporter. Um, he did a story just today mm -hmm. on, on our newscast talking about climate anxiety. He interviewed this amazing girl who was who had real anxiety. She was very worried that her that this um, this community in California of 200 people, she was she would stay up at night scared that, that a wildfire would destroy her family. And then in the story, William says, eventually that actually happened. And her fear of climate came right to her front door. Um, so I think that there are great mm -hmm. reporters that are doing some some really seminal work. I think of Jane Ferguson in Afghanistan, you know, taking the the risk of going back in Afghanistan to show the the plight of of, of young girls to show the starvation that's going on in that country. Mm -hmm. um, so I think people are really doing their best. I think, do we, are we, are we right all the time? Of course not. I have gotten things wrong. I'm not perfect. Um, but mm -hmm. I really think that journalists are trying their best. Well, I think that's one of the things that certainly stands out about Washington Week and PBS News Hour is that it's not a mosh pit of trying to figure out who the journalist is. Uh, and it makes a difference. And most people uh, in the public have never met a journalist. I know I never met one growing up. So, you know, the assumption that most people would know the rigor that goes into the work we do, uh, you know, who, who the credible sources are and who aren't, uh, you know, is, is, is not a given, right? And, and I think all the work that we can do to sort of educate the public about what we do and open our doors and expose ourselves in a certain way. Uh, certainly helps. You know, help help us help us. Maybe this is a help us understand what we're experiencing now politically, right? You you mentioned some of the big issues and the narratives out there: critical race theory, parental rights, and impact of mass mandates, and you know, let alone voter suppression and and the economy and um, other perennial issues. Um, and already a lot of inf you know a, a lot of narratives are emerging. Misinformation and disinformation is 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 you know is prevailing. So. You know, where are we? I mean, is democracy in peril? It's a great question, but I don't think that we'll know the answer for some time. It's it's yeah. the question is like, are we Rome or not? I, I have no idea, right? Like, yeah. like it's like Rome didn't know they were yeah. Rome until they were Rome. Yeah. Until right? they were Rome. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, but I think I mean we're living through a time, obviously, where where American democracy American democracy is being tested like never before. We're living through a time where we're seeing states 
failed before our eyes. I was just talking to a friend, um, a patient just said along with me uh, who was talking about Haiti and sort of sort of how that country has, has done my, you know, my family's still living in Haiti and think about mm -hmm. sort of, you know, Haiti, we thought Haiti was bad when there, were deal, when there were problems with poverty. And then we saw a president assassinated. We saw kidnappings go up 300%. We saw 17 um, foreigners, one Canadian and 16 Americans still be held hostage to this day. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that to me is, is, a, is an example of a country that sort of you think you're bad and then you hit a new rock bottom every single day. You think of a president being assassinated. Um, so I think that what we're living through in America is this real, I think, this this moment, this inflection point where you have people sort of conspiracy theories being married with, I think, this real fear of the future um, and also being married with some overt racism. Um, also, I think married to, to people who are genuinely sort of have whiplash with how quickly things have changed. Yeah. I was talking to somebody who said, you know, if you're an American who has lived from 1950s to 2021, you've seen a, a, a whole host of things change in yeah. this country. If you're an American who has lived through those years, so even as someone who's lived just through the last 35 years, and I think about sort of the growing influence of the internet, uh, I, I think that there are a lot of people who who are, are sort of... Um, trying to deal with sort of the, the 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 reality that we're all living with. But I also think that there's just straight up discord and that that discord is being, um, that that discord is, is sort of, I should say that there are politicians, frankly, stirring the pot. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll just think about January 6th. We have politicians now that are, that are calling it a tourist visit. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. we all witnessed what happened. Democrats and Republicans on the day were both saying that this is not okay. But Vice President Mike Pence, who's now sort of saying, you know, pe too many people are talking about January 6th, they need to let it go. He was running for his life. And then he had to make the sort of courageous decision to say, we're not, we're finishing our work today. I'm going back in this house mm -hmm. that was just broken into today to go certify the election. So I think, you know, there's yeah. some real interesting political calculations happening. Um, but I think, I mean, I think the question is, is to me still like, are we Rome? And I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And do you have any hope that something's about to break that fog? Uh, because it, you know, it, it it's it's it is interesting to see how how you know people still believe certain things. It's pretty easy to stoke uh, misinformation, and and there's intentional. I mean, as one of our questions, Diane Alexander asks, you know, Trump's era bringing the term fake news into regular coinage. You know, how his how has ha, has his hands affected news coverage for all of you? for all of us right yeah it's it's a great question i mean part of me also i thought i was talking to my friend who's also a journalist we were talking about if you're a student of history and i, I was an african-american studies um minor and, and studied international uh, sort, of, sort of international relations as a major at georgetown and for me i feel like i'm using my degree all the time because i'm thinking about sort of just reconstruction right like mm -hmm. like what happened right after you, you know that civil war happens then all, there, there's this sort of amazing period where almost like it was almost like the months after george floyd where people were like yes we're gonna do this we're gonna have diverse leaders we're gonna have our first black senators mm -hmm. and then reconstruction happens and then we get to the kkk era and black people getting terrorized and sort of the domestic terrorism that people had to live to through for generations I think this is a this is a country that has taken that has always taken sort of three steps forward, two steps back, and that's the way that we've sort of existed. So I don't know if we're in the two steps back phase right now, and then we're going to get three steps forward. So I think it's it's really interesting. I mean, journalism obviously is the first draft of history. It sometimes really feels like this is really the first draft of history. I've had that sense ever since I started in journalism that I've I've been. Um, blessed to cover these sort of seminal historic moments, but they're also sort of scary because I don't know where things are going. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, first drafts of history uh, also reflect the times we're in. I mean, if we're talking about people who have received, uh, you know, Pulitzers and posthumous Pulitzers was Ida B. Wells. Yeah. And uh, was, you know, writing about lynching all those years ago and and uh, was not recognized. And that certainly weren't, those certainly weren't stories that were covered in mainstream media. And so, um, you know, time times time in history really um you know also also impacts i think how things are covered um somebody else is asking um you know about the the government's response to the tragedy in haiti and again you know your roots run deep there You're, you still have family there this is linda wolston who's asking this question you know how should our government respond to the tragedy in Haiti? Um, and how did you feel just watching it most recently of, of people being deported pretty darn quickly? 
I mean, I think it's, it's a great question, but because I'm a reporter, in some ways, it's like, I'm not here to say what the government should be doing in Haiti. Mm -hmm. I can just, in some ways, report on what's happening. And we know what, what's happening is that um, we have an administration that is that is warning Americans who are living in Haiti to leave. They're also telling Americans that are thinking of traveling Haiti not to go, but then they're deporting thousands of people back to Haiti. Even though I will say there are thousands of people, thousands of Haitian immigrants that are also being allowed to stay in the United States. Mm -hmm. So I think that's an important part of this. There's also TPS. Um, for, for some Haitians, the temporary protected status where they can stay um, because of what's happened with the assassination of the president. So there, I think that, you know, mm -hmm. there are critics of this administration who would say they shouldn't be deporting people back. There are critics of this administration who are definitely saying um, this is an administration that doesn't have a humane policy toward Haiti. We've seen at least two um, administration officials, including Daniel Foote, who, was, who used to be the special envoy for Haiti, they resigned. Um, both of those officials that, that that publicly said that they were resigning because they found um, the policies of de deporting Haitians back to Haiti to be inhumane and to also just not make sense. Um, but then you have the Biden administration that's saying, look, we're in the middle of a public health crisis. They're leaning on this thing called Title 42. It was a Trump era policy that was created under President Trump to say, because of the coronavirus pandemic, we're going to sort of stop the asylum process um, as it usually stands, which is that people come, they're able to say their 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 claim of asylum, they stay for a couple months or even a year, and then they're, it's a, it's analyzed, and then they're sent back or allowed to stay. We're now, we're, when we see people um, at the border, when we obt obtain people at the border, Title 42 mm -hmm. lets you just deport them without going through that entire process. So, you know, the, but the Biden administration says, look, this is what has to happen. Um, and there, you know, the Haitian government is also a sort of, um, it's, there's also some real complexities there because you have part of the Haitian government is saying, yes, we can take these people back, deport them back to Haiti, we'll mm -hmm. take care of our own. And then you have Haitian officials who are going on the record saying, no, we cannot handle this. Their kidnappings have spiked 200%. Mm -hmm. We have a gas mm -hmm. shortage. We have a food shortage. Um, gangs control something like 60% of, of the country. I was just watching videos tonight um, the gangs are now trying to take over the White House mm. in it would, would the, the, it's called the Haitian National Palace, but it's basically mm -hmm. the White House of Haiti. That would be incredible, right? Like mm -hmm. that these mm -hmm. gangs have sort of set their sights so high that they're like, we want to invade the White House. Not just that, that the president's already been assassinated, but now we want to sort of take over the last row headquarters of the Haitian government. By the way, the Haitian White mm. House is still in shambles from the 2010 earthquake. So mm. if you go to Haiti right now and drive by the earth by by the White House, part of it is, is literally in, in pieces because of the 2010 earthquake 11 years ago. So that tells you sort of the, the, the dynamics in Haiti. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a complex, mm -hmm. it's a complex story. It's a complex issue. Um, and there are valid points being made on both yeah. sides. And I'm, I'm just feeling, I, I feel blessed to be able to cover it, to be able to speak the native language mm -hmm. and be fluent in Haitian mm -hmm. Creole, a language given to me by my ancestors. Mm -hmm. But it, it's, it's a tough story. Yeah, and, and actually so much of what you just explained you know, we only get bits and pieces of stories and we, we don't often get the, the full picture. So thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, I can't, uh, you know, let, let our conversation go by without talking about Gwen Eiffel for a minute. Uh, you know, she certainly was somebody, you know, I admired so much and, and you know, was a guiding light for me. And I know that she was a mentor for you. Um, talk about, you know, the advice she gave you about your name. I, I read a little bit about that, and I thought that was really interesting about you trying to truncate your name. Yeah, well, I, you know, Gwen Eiffel is she was she was such an amazing icon in journalism, such a fearless um, woman who really was a trailblazer in so many ways. I when I think about Gwen, I I, I can't talk about Gwen without also talking about a, a, one of her friends named Athelia Knight. She was mm. I call her my journalist as a mom because she was one of the first people that I really connected with and felt this deep connection with and still feel a, re a real deep connection with. Um, and and I think the, the great thing about Gwen is that she had these great girlfriends and they were all sort of, they were all sort of like-minded in that they saw that they, that they all mentor people and all help people. I think of Michelle Norris, um, who is mm -hmm. now at the Washington mm -hmm. Post, who I'm in touch with pretty regularly for all sorts of advice from should I, where, what a Houghton should I get to like, what do you think about this story to yeah. where should I get my hair done? You know, like to me, the, the, the mentorship that I got from Gwen, but from also from her girlfriends are, are, are is, is something that really has changed my life and, and, and really sowed so much in my life. And it's also inspired me to, 
to help the next generation of women is specifically black women coming up, mm -hmm. but also women in general and people in general. But, you know, I have some real mentors that I give advice to. Um, and I, I can almost hear Gwen in some ways laughing because I'm now giving this advice <laughs> as a sort of mentor, as if I got, as if I made up this advice when it's like, clearly I got this from Gwen. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but on my name, you know, I knew I, I met Gwen through our hairdresser. Mm. Um, it's just, it is what it is. I met her under a hairdryer. Um, and then I, um, a few, I would say a few months later, I bumped into her again at the National Association of Black Journalists. And I wanted to remind her who I was. And I said, I'm Yamish, but you can call me Mish. Because mm -hmm. my name being Yamish was always so hard for people to say. People were always sort of messing it up. Mm -hmm. So I was always trying to give people an out for, here's what you can call me. And she said, don't let people nickname you. And that, that, that advice stuck with me because what she was saying was don't sort of make it easy for people. Don't, don't leave part of yourself mm -hmm. on your journey to be a journalist, be, sort of have your own moral compass, know who you are, bring your experiences and, with you. And especially for my name, which is really, I say it's hipster Haitians because it was in the 80s. <laughs> parents were like, uh -huh. in love i'm sure like sitting on a quilt in like <laughs> cambridge square somewhere coming up with names for me um they put their names together to create my name and for me it, it means so much it means it means a lot about my haitian heritage it means mm -hmm. a lot about just the idea that i was loved before i was ever even walking this earth um mm -hmm. and it's something that i've never done again i've never allowed people to, to sort of truncate my name. I love my name, Yamish. Um, people have had to learn how to say it. It's been funny to, because of all the Trump uh, exchanges, people have really had to learn how to say it and spell it, <laughs> mm -hmm. which is, I find hilarious because yeah. growing up, like no one could say my name, right? <laughs> and now like everybody says my name, yeah. right? Um, and everyone knows yeah. how to spell it, which is hilarious. Um, but I think, you know, to me, it, it was advice that I stuck, that I, that sticks with me. And as I anchor Washington Week, which is really this surreal feeling, right? Like mm -hmm. Gwen had such a, a, a mm -hmm. mark on that show. She won a Peabody for the show. Joe, she was just she was just such a, an amazing seminal part of Washington Week for decades. Um, mm -hmm. That you know to now be at that at that chair, I I feel her mentorship. I think of her mentorship every single week as I'm putting together the show. And part of it is making sure that the show reflects me, that it reflects my mm -hmm. values. It reflects a show that for me means being relevant to people answering questions that people want to answer at their dinner table, um, translating power and politics so that when people sit down, they find the show relevant to their lives. And we're not just talking about sort of hypothetical things, but we're talking about how much gas costs, how much bread costs, how much your turkey is going to cost this year, yeah. right? So to me, that, that, that has meant a lot to me. Mm -hmm. And what's the best piece of advice that she gave you? I think the best piece of advice that she gave me was don't make yourself small. Mm. I remember I was I was considering all these different job opportunities. One of the job opportunities, um, it would have been it would have it, it just wasn't a job that I should have taken. And the way that she explained it to me was, mm. "Don't make yourself small." And 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 in that regard, it's be as ambitious as you want to be, dream as big as you want to. I think a lot of times women, um, they get labeled with this idea of ambition, and it's supposed to be a bad thing, you mm -hmm. know. Especially, I would say, black women in particular. You can be seen as aggressive, you can be seen as mean, you can be seen as sort of uh, as not a team player, all these sort of labels that are put on you um, for having the same dreams, frankly, as a white man. Mm -hmm. And I think that I think in this day and age of 2021, the thing that I think about all the time is just dream whatever I want to dream. I would never have thought I would be the, the, a moderator of Washington Week. Yeah. Um, it, it was sort of, sort of a dream yeah. that is far beyond anything I could even think of. Um, but the fact that I that I felt comfortable even reaching out for that, reaching out for 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 that, and accepting a job as big as this, um, mm. I think it is it really reminds me that that Gwen would not want me to be small, would not want mm -hmm. me to think small. Mm -hmm. And what was it about Washington Week? Because I imagine you could have written your ticket to a whole bunch of different places and, and that was your choice. So what is it about Washington week? I love PBS. Washington week. Yeah. I love Washington week and PBS um, and, and Washington week in particular, because I feel like it's, it's, you can't find it anywhere else. You find the best journalists in the country coming together to have a conversation, to share their reporting, to open up their notebooks in a way that they don't get to do when you're doing two or three minute hits on CNN mm -hmm. or CBS or mm -hmm. NBC. So you'll never nowhere else on, on TV. Are you watching the top white house reporter from CNN talk to the top White House reporter from NBC and the top Pentagon reporter from CBS, right? Like we, you'll never see that somewhere else. So I think for our, for, our, there are so many like shows that I'm proud of already, but I think of our George Floyd special. We mm. had on Wesley Lowry of CBS News, mm. talking to Sarah, Sarah Sider of CNN, talking to Tremaine Lee of NBC yeah. and talking to Aisha Rascal of NPR, four yeah. incredible, amazing mm -hmm. journalists um, who, 
would never have had that had that conversation that they had anywhere else on TV. Mm-hmm. And I think that makes Washington Week so special because I think it's a show that can really sort of bring people the conversations that journalists might have at a bar or over the dinner table that really illuminates sort of how stories get made, what's really happening both in Washington and around the country. And I think that that to me is what brought me to PBS. And I think the other thing is a, a real sense of, of going out and telling the story. So I'm a White House correspondent who goes out into mm-hmm. the country. Um, you know, I'm not only on the lawn of the White House. If you've seen me around mm-hmm. or watch my stories, I'm in, I'm in Southeast DC talking to people about not having mm-hmm. a hospital um, that, that's adequate in the middle of a pandemic. I'm in mm-hmm. Chicago talking to people about sort of gang violence. I'm in Mexico interviewing people who were kidnapped and, and, and faced violence under the mm-hmm. Trump administration's immigration policies. That's something that I love about PBS. I think that we go deeper and we really take the time to tell stories um, in a way that that you don't see other places. You know, I mentioned some of my colleagues, but I think of, you know, William did a, an entire special. He won an Emmy, William Brangham, my my colleague. He won, a, he won an Emmy for doing an entire special on what would happen if there was a big pandemic. This was, mm. this was, in, tw- this was mm. in 2019, yeah. Yeah. right? Wow. So who else was doing that reporting? Mm-hmm. William. William mm-hmm. was thinking like, what if a <laughs> pandemic hits us, right? Like, because he had sort of the foresight to be able to do that. Um, I think of, of, of so many other of our journalists that I think are just sort of great people telling good stories. Um, I think of John Yang, who, who was a great cops, who was a great courts reporter um, for us, having really in-depth conversations, not just about the sort of the latest Supreme Court ruling, but also about sort of what the shadow docket means, what it means that we're sort of living in this time where there's a 6-3 court, what it means that we can now mm-hmm. listen to the, to the Supreme Court live in audio and how that might have impacted sort of the way that the Supreme Court functions. I just don't think that you get that sort of in-depth reporting other places. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. Well, I'm going to, you know, I'd love to hog all the time with you, but I'm going to uh, go to our, some of our Q&As here. Um, Jack Platt asked, uh, my son is a senior at Newhouse as a journalism major. What little tidbit would you say to him? And he also says, thank you, you rock my world. So, so what tidbit, what, I, like, what advice? Yeah, what I kind of advice, me? yes. Yeah, um, I think that probably the best advice I got was go wherever the job takes you. Um, I was someone who desperately wanted to work at the Miami Herald. <laughs> like, like my mm-hmm. dream job was like, I'm going to be a course reporter at the Miami Herald for the rest of my life. And it's going to be amazing. <laughs> um, I thought about the fact that I speak Haitian Creole. So I was like, mm-hmm. Miami is a great place to be able to use that. Then the, the, the financial crash happened and there were no jobs at the Miami mm-hmm. Herald when I graduated mm-hmm. high school. So I had to go to work in Newsday in Long Island, New York. It was a tough decision. I'm a, I'm a Flor- Floridian. It was cold. I was writing about snow. I was writing about sort of going out at five o'clock in the morning with people salting the the um, the ground. I was ri- driving two hours away just to sort of chronicle dead whales on the beach. I mean, I can't. Mm-hmm. I covered so much stuff when I was in Long Island, <laughs> and I just kept saying yes because my mentors mm-hmm. and I think of Adelia and Gwen. They said just do the job. The job is mm-hmm. to report. You can get a great job. You know, you can get you can get a great job reporting. It might be in local news. You might have to move somewhere that you didn't want to move. I have a friend who moved to Omaha, Nebraska. Mm-hmm. You know, she didn't want to live in Omaha, Nebraska. Mm-hmm. Sorry if there are people out there who live in who are from Omaha, but guess what? It it paid off. She's now one of the youngest anchors in Raleigh, North Carolina. Mm-hmm. I think you have to go where the jobs are and actually go practice journalism. I had friends who took jobs at major organizations who were answering the phones, who were secretaries. Mm-hmm. Now, it's not to say mm-hmm. that those aren't jobs that you can eventually go and, and do great things mm-hmm. with, because mm-hmm. you definitely can. But I think for me, I found a real urge to go out and report and to take jobs where I was reporting on the street, um, talking to people every day. Those are the jobs that I think have been most fulfilling to me. So I would I would urge people when, when they give me advice, if they're you know looking at a, a great maybe job that's going to be mm-hmm. answering phones at a, at a great TV network or a job that's going to be reporting on people in a small town, I usually tell them, take the small town reporting job. You want to make sure that you sort of understand mm-hmm. the nuts and bolts of reporting. Yeah. Yeah. That's great advice. And, and by the way, Jack's son, Lewis was one of our interns uh, recently. So he's on his way. Uh, Lenina Cavicchio asks, um, have there been stories where you thought twice before reporting them? And what was the topic? Thought twice. I mean, I've, I would say every story, <laughs> every story that I do. I mean, I think about, uh-huh. I mean, you know, I was talking to my husband about this, who's also a journalist. I think the thing that I think makes great journalists, or maybe I think makes great journalists, who knows, um, 
I think is the fear of getting something wrong, right? Like I'm mm. constantly being like, did I spell that right? Do we have these numbers right? Fact check this. Like mm-hmm. our, I'm fact checking Washington week over and over again. I'm reading the script over and over again to make sure mm. it's, it, it's, it's accurate that we have all the dates, right? So I think for me, you know, on the nuts and bolts question, it really is like, I do the job I'm afraid of being wrong. I understand how much my platform, how big my platform is. Millions mm-hmm. of people are watching news hour, millions of people watching Washington week, um, millions of people watching these press conferences, right? I don't want to, I remember my big fear, especially when I started questioning the president on live television, you're talking about millions and millions of people because it's, it's being mm-hmm. streamed on CNN. And NBC, you know, it's like it's like every single channel is turned to you asking your question, and it's like I don't ever want to be wrong. So mm-hmm. if I'm asking a question, I'm I've researched that question, I've thought about that question, I've said that question out loud ten times. You know, I'm someone, especially if you watch news, have been watching me on News Hour. I sometimes talk too fast. I try to slow down, right, <laughs> to like get mm-hmm. myself. These are the things that I think I'm still learning as a journalist, right? Yeah. So I'm yeah. being very, in some ways, transparent in that. Like, I think I'm a young journalist who's still learning the craft, and I that mindset is the mindset that I come and bring to the table when I'm doing any story because I think I want to make sure that this is the best story for me, um, and then and then and then I'm bringing the people that are best. Um, that that can best tell that story to the table because you also have an incredible platform when you're when you're asking people to come mm-hmm. on Washington Week or when you're asking people to be part of your story. So I want to make sure that those are people who have good intentions and they're people who uh, really know what they're talking about. So I think that that's really important to to me. So I, I would say that's the way I would answer that question. That I think I think twice about every story. <laughs> there you go, all of them. Uh, you know, Mary Sims uh, asks. Um, you know, I'll I'll rephrase that a little bit, but. You know, are you surprised by the sentences so far um, uh, in regard to the January 6th insurrection? It's a great question, but you know, I feel like our justice system is our justice system. You know, Mm. I've covered so many things um, you know, I covered the trial of George Zimmerman. I was, mm-hmm. I've covered, you know, so many things where, where, where the public, the public sentiment was, of course, George Zimmerman's going to be found guilty. And then of course, mm-hmm. not guilty on all charges. Mm-hmm. I've covered, you know, the, the, the trial of Derek Chauvin, where m- most people thought, okay, this is a video where it's going to be pretty clear that he's going to be found guilty. But when you, when I talked to people on the street after he was found guilty, you could feel the general surprise because it's so rare for a police officer to be found guilty. So when you fast forward, to these January 6th um, uh, convictions and sentencings, it all depends on what the person did. I think I will tell you that the thing that surprised me, not so much the sentencing, mm-hmm. I remember the day of January 6th, having covered mm-hmm. a lot of Black Lives Matter protests, I remember thinking, is there going to be lethal force used? Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. I remember being on the street with Black people in Ferguson, Missouri, who were peacefully walking unarmed, who were tear gassed, who were, who were shot with rubber bullets, who had to run for their lives. Um, and I just didn't see the level of force that I would have thought would happen um, at, at, at the Capitol. Now, of course, it, it's not in some ways a criticism of police because police say that, that in some ways they didn't want to make it worse. They knew that they were outgunned. They knew that they were sort of in this volatile situation where they didn't want to make it worse. So tear gassing the crowd might have agitated them more. Sh- shooting r- rubber bullets might have you know, turned into a, 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 a firefight. So I'm not criticizing mm-hmm. the, the, the police in that way. But I am saying that like as a reporter, I was... I was frankly really, really surprised just as how, just at how someone who um, someone could make it into the into the office mm-hmm, of Nancy mm-hmm, Pelosi mm-hmm. without see, without seeing some sort of lethal force used against them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, were you surprised uh, that the insurrection happened at all? Of course. Did you, see, did you see that coming? Well, I mean, you know, there there are others who said like, well, you know, we saw that coming. Maybe not to that degree, but yeah. I mean, I just I'm not a fortune teller at all. I yeah. in some ways <laughs> I kind of think that people, um, you know, I'm I'm I will say that I was I was pretty surprised. I mm-hmm. think you know I I did this story. I did this story where um, I was interviewing people because you know the, before January 6th it was about you know President Trump didn't want to um, he didn't want to concede. So I ended up doing this story about immigrants who came to America because of America's political stability. And I, and I got the idea to do that story because there are so many immigrants who I was talking to, especially in my family, who were saying, you know, this reminds me of Haiti. Like, how, like in what world is an American president not wanting to concede? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I did a lot mm-hmm. of interviews with people from Nicaragua, from Belarus, and from Haiti. And there was this one Haitian professor who told me, you know, there's going to be violence. Former President Trump at the time, the President Trump, he said, you know, he has all these people who are following him all these people who are believing his lies, all these people who could become armed and could, and could all get together and really do some violence. And we reported on that. And it was in some ways mm-hmm. sort of a premonition to January 6th. It, and it was some, in some ways, 
it was someone who had lived through that sort of violence, having lived under mm-hmm. a dictator in Haiti, my parents having lived under that same dictator, who could really see this in a clear eyed way, because I think in some ways as an American journalist, my bias is that I think America works, right? Like my mm-hmm. bias is that I'm like, well, surely the Capitol won't be overrun. Like mm-hmm. there's police, there's security. <laughs> And, you know, I mean, and I was, and especially I, I, I experienced January 6th while standing on the lawn of the White House, yeah. where, you know, I, th- I think standing on the lawn of the White House, to me, I find it to be the sort of bubble of security. And I always thought of the Capitol in the same way, that there's sort of these mm-hmm. bubbles of security, when in fact, obviously the Capitol is not a bubble of security. We, we I, I, I would, it's almost like I would be as shocked if someone broke into the White House. You mm-hmm. would just never think that someone would make it all the way across the White House and into the Oval Office, that something would have stopped mm-hmm. them between them. And, you know, in some ways it's like, we, we think that that's still true, but it's really scary. Yeah. 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 And it, and it, it's the severity of it for many seems to have kind of dissipated as well, which, which is kind of incredible. And Cherry asked, um, you use social media very effectively as a journalist. Your tweets are shared widely and become subjects of articles, but we've also seen how social media has caused misinformation and disinformation to spread. So how do you view social media's impact on your job and journalism in general? Um, and what's your strategy for using it? Because one of the interesting things that you have talked about in your, with your tweets in particular is how you also always try to pro- provide context. Uh, so how do, you, how do you do that? Yeah, I mean, I think social media, I, I would say, especially when I think about social media, I would, I would say Twitter in particular, mm-hmm. um, because I think that that's the place that I use the most. Um, I think that it, it does. It's it's more beneficial than doing harm. I think of social media, especially Twitter, as being both a window into people's lives that I might not see or meet, um, and 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 they will give me information on the ground that I can, of course, then go and check out it and and sort of figure out if it's accurate. Um, but I also think of it as as a great place to be able to break news, to be able to to be able to tell stories, um, to be able to provide context. I think all of those are really important. I would say that my um, my approach to Twitter is much like my approach to, to what I, when I describe storytelling, I think I use Twitter afraid. I use Twitter with the fear of being wrong. I use Twitter, the fear of jumping to conclusions. I'm not tweeting mm-hmm. when I'm angry. I'm not tweeting when I'm fired up. I will put out my phone and go walk away. If I think something has, 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 you know, sort of um, made me feel a, a certain emotion. I think for me, I think for me, especially as a journalist, we have to be really, really responsible. Um, and, and we can save sort of our, our sort of venting for the people that are closest to us, my mom or my husband. But um, mm-hmm. I think Twitter should be used really as information. And I would say most of the time, I, I not most of the time, I would say all the time, I tweet out stuff that I would also want to be seen blasted out on news, on news hour to a million mm-hmm. people. You know, mm-hmm. I have a million, I have a million and two followers. Mm-hmm. The, the, yeah. The information I put out, I know will be seen by a bunch of people and I don't want to be wrong. And when I am wrong, I don't delete tweets. I say, hey, that last tweet, I spelled someone's name wrong. I remember once I was live tweeting um, something in Missouri and I literally spelled the governor's name wrong like four times. <laughs> I remember like Jonathan Capehart like yelling at me on Twitter, like you're spelling his name wrong. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I was tweet- I was texting too fast, right? Yeah. Like those are sort of the sort of embarrassing moments, but they're also moments that, that tell people you're human, right? Like if mm-hmm. I make a mistake on Twitter, if I say something that's wrong or I get a figure that's wrong, I want to be transparent about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, well, not everybody, not everybody follows those same rules. And so it really, um, you know, matters how, how you've done your job. And, um, you know, particularly, I think with the younger generation of journalists, it's important to see that example from you. Uh, yeah, and I would say one other thing I would say, you know, because one thing I guess I didn't touch on was that there is the dark side of social media, obviously. Mm-hmm. We, we did a whole half a show on Washington Week on Facebook, um, the anxiety that that it creates in young girls, the sort of co- the, the competitiveness where people are sort of comparing themselves to people's the highlight reels because, you know, no one puts a, on, on Twitter or on Facebook or on Instagram when you when you had a bad day, right? It's always your greatest yeah. day ever. So I think I'm really also careful with my mental health not to sort of want, use Instagram to compare myself to other people. Mm-hmm, I would say mm-hmm. Facebook, I'm very aware that Facebook has some real issues in terms of uh, of the way that they're, they're, they're creating their algorithms. So and I've been covering that a lot. I don't, I'm not an expert on sort of all of the different issues with, with, with Facebook, but I've had some really smart reporters break down why Twitter in particular is a lot different than Facebook mm. um, and Instagram. So I think that's why mm-hmm. I, I would say I, I don't use Facebook and Instagram as much as I do Twitter. I think Twitter is sort of a place where it's, it, it, it is, I think the easiest space to really use um, to spread information if you're a journalist. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you know, you, you've referenced already about just, you know, you're a black journalist, you're a black woman, you're a journal. I mean, you're, you're all of that. Right. And, and, and without apology, 
uh, and you bring some unique perspectives uh, as well. And I, I'm looking at this question actually from uh, one of my colleagues here at WHYY, uh, who says that, you know, one of the complaints that uh, we sometimes get is we talk about race too much, uh, that talking about race is divisive, um, you know, how would you reply to this comment and how can we push back in a way that shows the importance of this discussion, uh, that it concerns everyone and can, can also bring us closer together? Any thoughts yeah, I mean, I think, you know, to me, I would say it's, it's that, well, this country's original sin was slavery and that race is a part of everything that we do. Um, and it is what it is. So, you know, th that to me is, mm -hmm. is sort of the like bluntness that journalists have to have. How do you how, to me, I, I think of, of the pandemic? Could you cover the pandemic accurately without talking about the racial disparities? Thank Can you cover you. this mm -hmm. this economy without covering the fact that women of color um, and women in general are are sort of bearing the brunt of and having the, the, the most hardship when it comes to to economy to economics? Can we cover education? Um, having just seen someone win the governorship of Virginia basically spreading falsehoods about critical race theory and convincing mm -hmm. people that 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 this sort of um, teaching method exists when it doesn't. I don't know how you cover that race without talking about race, right? I don't know mm -hmm. you cover mm -hmm. the election without talking about race. So I think when you're not talking about race, and I don't think it has to be every single conversation, but I think if we are shying away from talking about race, we're doing a disservice because in the reality is, people are still living their lives. Black people and white people are still living their lives. Latinos, transgender people, they're still living their lives with all of the sort of disparities that they have to deal with on an everyday basis. And I think it's that journalists, our, our job is not to ignore that and hope that it goes away. Our job is to shine a light on that. So, you know, to me, you know, we've been talking about race, but I also think that we should be talking about LGBTQ issues. Mm -hmm, we should be talking mm -hmm. about transgender women and the, and the violence against them. I also think we should be also talking about white rural voters, right? Mm -hmm, white mm -hmm. rural voters, they turned out in, in huge numbers in Virginia. We need to really explore, what does that mean? There was a great um, series done by this guy named Ested Herndon. He's a reporter for the New York Times, who was writing about white identity politics. You know, we spend so much time talking about black identities mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. Latino, but there's, there, is, there, are, there are unifying issues among white Americans based on race that is absolutely making people fired up to, to vote for particular candidates. And I think that we need to be writing about that as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I know you have a hard stop, so I'm going to just end with, uh, you know, a lot of our, um, you know, audience also has has great concern for you and wants to know what you do for self-care and what do you do for fun. So we're going to just end on a fun note here. Yeah. Well, thanks. One, I'll just say thanks so much um, for inviting me again. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to be with HYY. One of the things that I do is I hang out with my Eagles, my Philadelphia Eagles loving husband. Uh, um, <laughs> shout uh, out you know, to your I, husband. Yeah. Right. Um, I spent a lot of time with him. We've been married now going on about to be four years. I found that spending time with him, um, taking walks, just doing yoga, working out, just spending time binge watching squid games and all sorts of other stuff <laughs> that that has been a really, really important part of this. I think the last year, um, not having the, the connections that we, that we, that we wanted to have with our family and our friends, I think is really underscored for me, how important it is to, to, to love on the people that love us, to see, to mm -hmm. visit the people who mean the most to us to, to really recalibrate um, our work-life balance. Of course, we always say work-life balance and for journalists, there isn't yeah. that much balance, yeah. but especially right. if you're married to a journalist. So we yeah. talk about journalism all the time. Um, but you know, that means that I spent, I, I, I go home to my mama, right? I go mm -hmm. and see my mm -hmm. mom when I can, every chance I get, I'm on the phone with her. I talk to her probably way too much, um, multiple times a day, but I, I make time, I make time and I say, and mm. I also take days off when mm. I'm tired. If I don't feel, maybe sometimes it's that I'm sick. Right. Maybe sometimes it's that mm -hmm. I have a stomach flu or that I'm not feeling great, but maybe sometimes it's just that I'm tired and that I just need a mental health day. Um, I think that we should really be real with ourselves when you wake up and you just feel like I don't have it in me today that you mm -hmm. should be able to give yourself that. You know, I think so many, I think the American way is to push through. The American way is to sort of try your best and work your hardest. And we should be doing that. I do that every day. But I also think that I've learned, especially in this last year and a half, to really take time for yourself, really check in to make sure you're okay, both physically and mentally. Um, you know, we've lost some some real great giants to cancer, to all sorts of sicknesses. So for me, it also means, self-care also means literally going to the dentist, going to get my yearly checkup, going to get mm -hmm. mammograms, right? Mm -hmm. Going mm -hmm. to the OBGYN. Yeah. To me, it also means really taking the time to not just, you know, skip your dental appointment three years in a row because you're too busy writing. It's like, no, I don't want to die of ginger, gingivitis, right? Like, yeah. I want to make sure that I'm, I'm healthy, both in my mind and in my body. So that's also something that I really think about. 
Well, that that's wonderful and how intentional it is. You know, I'm going to I'm going to close our conversation because I know you have to run. Uh, you know, I I I know when I was watching Gwen Eiffel, I would always say, you know, I'm just so grateful that she's there. And so I want to sincerely say to you, I'm so grateful that you're there too. So you are, it's almost scary that you're, you're just getting started because the sky's the limit for you. Uh, but, you know, grateful for your time, grateful that you do what you do. And, um, you know, we look forward to seeing where your next, next chapters go, because, you know, you're, 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 you're speeding through a whole lot of stuff. And, um, you know, we know that we have a, a big election coming up. We know that we have a lot to process every each and every day about, you know, how decisions impact our lives. And so we're grateful that you're there doing what you do. So thank you. Thank you again for your time. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you.